From Sugar 23, I'm Angela Ledgerwood, and this is Lit Up. Happy New Year, everyone. This is our first episode of the year, and we are so excited to talk to Hilary Kelly, a book critic at Vulture and New York Magazine, who contributes as well to The New Yorker and The LA Times. I find Hillary's criticism refreshing, saucy, and smart. She judges a book by what's inside of it, not by the hype machine around it, like a true critic. So what we're going to talk about today is the important books that we might have missed in 2021 and the books we're looking forward to in 2022. I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm so thrilled to have Hillary Kelly on the pod. Welcome to Lit Up. Hi, thanks for having me. So I was just trolling your Twitter and I saw this amazing quote and you said, I want to be on a panel where we just talk about the books we know tons of other people pretend to like. Yeah. So we're not on a panel, but we're on a pod. Is there one book that you feel people pretend to like so much that you wish they would just stop talking about? I don't know if there's one book in particular. It's There's more that's been this energy that's been percolating for the past few months, especially this fall, where it felt like fall 2021 was lined up as this giant fiction bonanza where we were going to get books from all the heavy hitters. Our bookshelves were going to overflow with goodness. And it turned out if you watched the books roll out, all the big names, reception to a lot of them was actually very tepid, but nobody actually wanted to criticize the books. And instead, it was more of a, this was okay. And I'm glad I read it because so and so is a masterful writer and a lot of like referring back to the fact that you know, this person is great, but maybe this time it wasn't perfect. And I just wanted somebody to be really honest and be like, you know, the Richard Powers book was really treacly and, you know, redo of a lot of the things he had done in the overstory, which was, you know, one of the great novels of the past 20 years. But this was like the Reader's Digest overstory with a particularly tear yanking finish. And funnily enough, that is the one book that Dwight Garner sort of had a memorable line about where he said it was it made him want to flick an otter in the head because it was it, it was so like nature loving and just sort of like granola crunchy. But but most of these books, it seemed like everybody wanted to be excited about them because everybody wanted a lot of great books to come out and it didn't happen. And nobody's come out and been like, you know what, this fall, a lot of fiction, the big fiction, it actually kind of sucked. It didn't live up to our expectations. And I want a lot of people to just like sit around and talk to me about that. Well, it's funny you mentioned that book in particular, because I said to my boyfriend who loves Richard Powers and had read that novel, shall I take this one, you know, on Sunday on a bus trip? And he said, you know what? I wouldn't, you know, and he is obsessed with him. And so I didn't. And thinking about this conversation we were going to have, and I'm so excited because I also couldn't locate in my mind, what the big books were that I had adored this year. So I'm so excited to hear from you. It feels like people are being kind to publishing and to writers because there's been a crazy pandemic. And I feel like maybe we're all a little less snarky and wanting to say kind of bad things about things. But what happens is you end up kind of getting a tepid, neutral, And it doesn't feel like a really invigorating conversation about books. Yeah. A novelist who I'm friendly with, I've never written about her work, but Amber Sparks is her name. She tweeted something the other day about how distasteful she finds galley excitement these days. I don't know if all of your listeners are like insidery about the way that it works, but usually, you know, critics and editors get advanced copies of books anywhere from a month to six months in advance. I'm reading a book that's coming out in August right now. So we get things very far along and there's sort of this atmosphere on Twitter, especially where it's like, oh, I just got the new Sheila Hetty novel. I just got the new Mohsen Hamid. Here, like here's my status marker that I'm a person who 
gets these books, has early access. I mean, I'm an arbiter of taste, whatever. Not, I'm not saying I am. <laughs> That's the idea behind this. And it creates a hype machine that is, it's impossible to tear down in the moment because no one's read the books yet. And I feel like the the hype machine around like, I love this novelist, her novel is coming out in four months, therefore I need to make a huge public to do about it, has sort of like taken over a lot of the literary conversation. And we don't always wait or, or even by the time the book comes out, a lot of the talk has already sort of simmered by because everyone's just talked about how excited they are for a few months. Yes, but they haven't read the book. Right. I've done it too because it is exciting. But the thing is, I'm not really posting because I'm excited because I've read them and they're great. It's more like they're here. It, it tends to benefit certain kinds of writers, though, in a way that is, I don't want to say unfair, because let's just say that you're already part of a class of people who went to Iowa Writers Workshop together, and a lot of them have become successful novelists. And so they're saying, look at the cover of this book, look at this book I just got. It, it, it creates this system where the same people are rewarded over and over, and a lot of the people whose work really deserves the time and like attention of readers and critics doesn't get it because they just they don't have an in to the hype machine in the way that other people might. And I mean, this isn't something new. This has been going on forever. I mean, who you know has, has always been pretty important in publishing circles. But it just feels like a cycle that even though I know I've been a part of it, I'm a little bit sick of right now or a little bit sort of just disgruntled by. You know, you just mentioned that you're reading something for August and you write really beautiful and in-depth profiles of certain writers. Can you talk us through the process of choosing that person? I have to feel like the book that they're writing is moving them in a new direction. And I have to feel like who they are matters just as much as what they're producing. There are a lot of amazing novelists out there who will tell you that they are people who sit in a room quietly alone for a lot of hours a day and that their process is, you know, very internal and maybe they're not a big part of the publishing scene, all that kind of stuff. And it doesn't mean that it's not worth it to write about their work, but I often find the work itself so engaging that I don't want to pull the person into it unless they have something about their experiences or their living situation, something that went into the producing this particular novel that feels like it has to be uncovered for us to better understand their work. And that's a little bit controversial because there are a lot of people who I think get upset when you want to talk about the author's life. Like when you say like, well, I really want to know if, you know, X, Y, Z went on this cross country road trip and did a lot of acid. Like I care about that. But I think we can't get around the fact that we are interested in authors' lives and we want to know where stories come from. I mean, these are questions that we've had forever and we're going to keep trying to answer them, sometimes imperfectly, but, you know, I, I don't see anything wrong with thinking through, like, how did you get from a blank page to here and what happened to you that made that possible? Can you tell us about Claire V. Watkins, what her latest book is about? It came out in uh, 2021 and what you discovered about her that was really fascinating. Claire V. Watkins, I had read all of her other work before I thought about this profile. And then she wrote, you know, a beautiful first novel. And so when I saw she had this book coming out, it's called I Love You, But I've Chosen Darkness. First of all, I loved the it's title. the best title. <laughs> but I realized that the way she lived terrified me. And some of that is that she lives quite literally in the Mojave Desert um, and a place I can't imagine being. And also that she has managed to decouple herself from a lot of the expectations of women my age. And her and I are the same exact age. We're both 37. We both have one child. How did she do this? Like, how did she get to this place where she lives so freely? And I don't imagine that she doesn't have 
concerns or guilt or any of those feelings, but it just felt like she poured out in this novel every thought that you might have surrounding ambivalence about having a child and where that comes from and what you do about it. But I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified of the kind of life that she had because it seemed so untethered from like everything that I feel like holds me into this like little, you know, row house in Washington, D.C. And actually my editor didn't at first want me to fly out to to do the interview. And he wanted me to just try and like do it over Zoom, which had become super commonplace during the pandemic. And I found so limiting, like just I felt it was so impossible to get to know a novelist or any kind of writer through a screen. And I just kept like begging, please, please let me come to California. I I promise it'll be worth it. We have to be in the desert together. And if I wasn't pregnant, we'd have to go do some drugs, sitting among the rocks, watching the sunset, you know. (laughs) And finally, he was like, you know what? I think you're right. Come out to California. Come meet her. And... I mean, it was an, actually like a wonderful experience being out there. She, it sounds strange, but she like going to see her helped me personally get over a lot of my own fears, which is not the reason that you should write a profile of someone. But she was incredibly welcoming and incredibly kind and incredibly sure of who she was and what her life was. And she comes from this very intriguing background. Her father was Charles Manson's right-hand man in the lead-up to the Helter Skelter murders. He actually sort of parted ways with them, I think, just weeks before that happened. Her mother was, unfortunately, a victim of the opioid epidemic and died of an overdose. And she had this very wild upbringing for me, for somebody who grew up in like a, you know, on like a normal city street. And she was just so fully herself. And that's one of the things that draws me to profile subjects, because there are a lot of people out there who are striving to write a novel that a lot of people are going to want to read. And I think Claire was striving to write the novel that was already there and just had to sort of like come out of her and be reassembled. I found that very appealing. What are some of the things that you are afraid of that you feel were calmed by being in her presence. I've always thought to myself that I'm going to write an essay collection and it's just going to be 65 essays because I'm afraid of so many things. Each one is going to be about some inane fear that I have. First of all, I'm terrified of the desert. And she wrote this wonderful story in Battleborn about two friends who decide to go for a hike in the desert and they underestimate what the desert can do to them and only one makes it back from the hike. So it's funny, like her work had sort of triggered a little bit of this fear in me and then going out there and seeing, I guess seeing the fact that like the desert is not this lifeless barren wasteland. Claire knows the names of all the plants around her and she knows exactly what different animals do and she understands the weather patterns. It's very much a part of her literal minute to minute identity, I realized like, oh, she's comfortable in this the way that I'm comfortable around, you know, giant sycamore trees in the city. And it was very soothing. But I mean, as for a list of all of my fears, we definitely don't have time because I live on fear. (laughs) It's what keeps me. (laughs) So I know part of why I wanted to talk to you so much was to kind of prime us and our audience for all the books out 2022. But I do want to still cast back uh, to 2021 because they're the books that are you know out for everyone to to go by and, and dev- devour. Were there any in particular that really struck you that you felt just didn't get that recognition and you'd love people to pick up? There are definitely a few this year. One that I wrote about that I still want so many people to read. It's called Night Bitch by Rachel Yoder. And it's about a mother who turns into a wolf, basically, is the only... (laughs) She is a a disgruntled stay-at-home mom. She used to be an artist, particularly a performance artist. And she feels herself physically becoming a wolf. I mean, she grows what she thinks is a tail. She starts to chase and kill rabbits in her yard with her teeth. And I think that there has been a huge flux of motherhood literature 
in the past few years. And what I loved about this one was that it was very visceral. It was very much about the physical experience of being a mother and what it is like to nurture a child and also constantly have it feel like it's physically attached to you and you just want the space that you once had. And it also is a novel that manages to say like motherhood is extremely difficult. It can absolutely crush your identity. And it's also completely absurd. Things you do and say and the way you behave with your children can be like absolutely comical. She really hit all of that. And it was a debut novel, which also really impressed me. And I also was a little bit sad that Although it, you know, definitely got coverage that the new novel by Rivka Galchin wasn't more broadly celebrated. It was a really smart story about a woman who's accused of being a witch. It's based on a real life story about the astronomer Johann Kepler's mother, who was really accused of being a witch in 17th century Germany. And he eventually got her sort of out of this pickle because he was famous and connected. But it was a very wise book about finger pointing and mass movements to criticize information spread and whether or not you can ever really trust the information that you're looking at. I happen to think that everything she does is riveting. She has this very mathematical mind that somehow also puts out these wild creative novels and it's really slim it's so it's so easy to read you can read it in a few hours uh, <laughs> so i really wish more people had had talked about that one well we'll try and get some sales bumps for these two we'll we'll try and get it out in the world i think hearing you talk about it i want to read both so badly so this helps okay so now 2022, and you said that you've noticed that there's a, trends of motherhood in fiction. I'm definitely seeing that. And in, But looking back on 2021, were there any other trends that you've seen percolating that you think are going to travel through to 2022 or any that you feel like, oh, I can't see another book about that? What I'm about to say is a, such a big topic that you're going to wonder if I'm ever going to be able to read a, a novel again. But I'm personally finding it difficult to read Trump era novels, the novel of contemporary malaise brought on by authoritarianism or brought on by fascism or any of these things, which are things that I care deeply about on a political level and I think have to be included in the literature that we're writing right now, especially literature we're writing you know, about the American state or the American experiment or what it means to be an American. But at the same time, I often find it very hard to read about something that I'm currently living through and to feel like I have enough distance from it to understand if it's if it's good literature or if it's pulling at something inside of me I already want to be outraged about or I you know, want to feel sympathy for. Remembering <laughs> this is a strange example, but right after... World War One, Edith Wharton kept writing about World War One because this colossal thing had just happened and the whole globe had been shaken and they were redrawing national boundaries in ways that are still causing chaos today and and nobody was buying her books about World War One because everybody just had had enough. They were like, we're done. That's when she pivoted away from that and all of a sudden her stock rose again. I mean, it literally was affecting her lifestyle, which was very lavish, but it was affecting her lifestyle because she wasn't making the money that she had been making before that. And I think that that makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, we can only handle so much of our current very oppressive reality. I, I found myself reading a lot this year books that were written and published in like the 1950s or the 1970s. I mean, I read a lot of like Midwest Americana, which was about a completely different set of American problems because I just didn't want to be, I didn't want to be in this world when I was in it. And then also in this world when I was working and then also in this world when I was relaxing, it just felt like too much. Well, and I think it's interesting, the COVID books, everyone can't really engage with because we're too close because we're still all 
traumatized by by everything that's happened. I think I'm craving comedy, like really whip smart comedy, kind of satirical writing, but they're hard to find funny contemporary books. Yeah. It's hard to find books about happiness <laughs> and and there are really good narrative reasons why that is because happiness is not a problem to solve and narrative wants a problem. But I know that I'm infamous in my family. I have two sisters who also love to read. My mom loves to read. So, of course, they're often asking me, you know, what's coming out that's really good or what's secretly really bad. And every suggestion I give them, they're like, that book was really depressing. And I'm like, yeah, it was. I don't understand books about happy people. I don't know what I'm doing while I'm reading them. Like, it feels like I'm just sort of spinning in a circle in the middle of my living room because I don't know what else, what does the book want from me? If everything is solved, I'm just going to see myself out. I'm not the person to turn to for your happy recommendations, with the exception of Laurie Colwyn's novel, Happy All the Time, which is about two couples who just are very content. And I, I found myself reading it and thinking, well, this is nice. Like, <laughs> this is a nice break. These people are just often delighted to be with one another. And Isn't that crazy? Like you think about art and so little art is made around, like you said, happiness or a, there isn't a journey. If there isn't a growth or a journey or a place to get to, what's the point? But maybe that is a nice reprieve for us all. That's a good recommendation, especially from you. I, I think I go for contentment instead of happiness. There are certain novels that feel really quiet to me. Like I could reread Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson over and over again. The characters in that are not particularly happy. I mean, happiness, again, is it, happiness is not a super interesting emotion. But there's something very still about what happens in her work. I just read a novel that apparently I should have been reading for decades and I, I just didn't know about it but William Maxwell's So Long See You Tomorrow and it's actually it's about something that sounds quite dark it's about a boy who is telling the story of a murder that took place in his town when he was young but there's just something very compassionate about it and his prose style has a, a kind voice to it it feels approachable even in its darkness well, that's a lovely recommendation too. I saw you posted that on Twitter. It is something, isn't it? When you find something you really connect with so much that you have to share it. It's a lovely impulse to have. So I loved seeing that as well. Okay. So this year, 2022, any standouts that you are excited about? There are a lot of memoirs coming out in this coming year by women whose work I have read with a lot of interest in the past. Megan O'Rourke has a new memoir coming out that is about chronic illness. It's called The Invisible Kingdom. Heather Haverleski has a memoir coming out about marriage. It's called Foreverland, but her take on marriage is that it's <laughs> a bit of a trap and we shouldn't expect, we expect too much out of marriage, essentially, which I think is a very interesting idea for reasons that I shouldn't explain because my husband will probably hear this. <laughs> and I don't think my marriage is a trap. And then uh, Maud Newton has a, a memoir coming out called Ancestor Trouble, which is grown out of an essay that she wrote, I think, four or five years ago now. And she traced her genealogy and found some completely wild stories. But she writes about what we want to know about who we are and where it comes from and how much we can really feel connected to people who came before us who may have acted in ways that we find either abhorrent or just alien. And so those three, in terms of nonfiction, I'm intrigued by. There are a lot of novels coming out from names that are people who, you know, I think are going to get a lot of attention. And that's always worth thinking about. Uh, what are the conversations going to be? Jennifer Egan has a follow-up to A Visit from the Goon Squad, which I, I think is going to get tons of coverage. It's going to be intriguing to see how well someone can pull off a book, a sequel or a cousin, she calls it, 
to a book that was so original in its time and whether or not what she is able to do the second time around feels original, feels like it has to be original. Yeah, because even the form of it in that kind of PowerPoint presentation style for some of it was so fresh and like, whoa, she's doing it. And now I feel like we have so many forms that we just accept so many forms. So maybe she's doing something, pushing it again. Have you had a chance to look at it or see it? I I have. I don't know what I'm even f- forbidden from giving away. Some books come with embargoes and we're not, <laughs> you're told basically like, don't you dare reveal anything. I went back, let's put it this way. I went back and reread A Visit from the Goon Squad because I hadn't read it maybe since it came out. And I was so excited reading it because it still felt It felt like she had basically invented this whole new way of piecing things together. It made me worried for her. I I don't know her, but it made me worried for her that so many people have now taken her forms and run with them. Like, how can she hold on to what's hers and give it something fresh? And I think that that's probably what is going to interest a lot of critics because it is another story told in disparate but connected parts, the way that Goon Squad was. So, you know, it was a hard trick to pull off once, and she did it so well. I would be nervous <laughs> to, just, to be her, not because, not because I think she can't do it, but just because it's a lot to live up to. And the same goes for the new novel from Hanya Yanagihara, who, you know, wrote the tearjerker to end all tearjerkers with A Little Life, and now has this uh, very different novel coming out in January called To Paradise. And it's also set in New York. We're mostly set in New York. It also has multiple points of view, but the pressure after a blockbuster, I wouldn't want to be in those shoes, although nobody would mind being the person who wrote the blockbuster, right? So my sense from her about her is that she's she doesn't really care what other people think. Like she's very sure about her work. I've chatted to her too. I love her and I think she's so creative and in many different ways. I think it's impossible to buffer ourselves from the world's opinion, but my sense is that she has a very strong sense of self. So, I'm simply impressed by the fact that she managed to write another, I can't remember exactly how many pages to Paradise is, but it's somewhere around 800 pages. And she is also the editor-in-chief of a magazine. And <laughs> and it's that, she's prolific and she's always traveling to these incredible places. Right. She's the best person to follow on Instagram for the escapism. But I think knowing that she works so hard is part of the the fun of watching. I'm like, okay, here is a human that has an incredible capacity. Maybe part of the reason why her novels are so sweeping and so like greedy for detail. When her characters walk down a street in New York, you know how cold it is and what trash is blowing and what other sorts of people are walking by. And this like wonderful Victorian idea about building an entire world and just letting yourself run wild with it when it comes to page count. This year is going to be the 150th anniversary of Middlemarch. So I think hopefully there will be some really good, thoughtful work about it. But that's one of the reasons that people keep going back to novels like that, because they're so completely bubbled. I mean, you're inside of them and everything looks and smells and feels of itself and the way that its creator made it. It makes me want to go and read Great Expectations again. You know, those immersive novels that with villains and things. Well, we don't have much time, Hilary. But you cover TV as well. What TV should we be looking forward to in 2022? One is that we're finally getting Julian Fellow's The Gilded Age. Christine Baranski is playing the lead, and she is such a sly and smart actress that I'm really quite excited to see, you know, situations he puts her in. There's been like a lot of talk about like, are we living in the second Gilded Age? And what does that mean? People always want to see the lives of the the rich 
play out because we're all voyeurs and we all want to see the worst aspects of their lives and sort of make ourselves feel a little bit better that terrible, terrible things happen to the super rich. And the other show, which I don't know when it's coming out, is Sofia Coppola's rendition of A Custom of the Country by Edith Wharton, which I don't even know if it's been cast yet, but I think about it, <laughs> I think about it all the time. She is so good at understanding what lies underneath frivolity and having her version of Marie Antoinette's life story and now getting to watch her bring to life Undine Sprague, like one of the great heroines of the 20th century. I'm just very excited about that. And I think about all the time I've been harassing, actually, the poor people who are producing it and being like, give me the information. I need to know. Well, yeah, maybe hearing you talk about it will prompt... You know, the wheels to start turning. Okay, so what lights you up? What lights me up? I think it's hard when you're a parent to think outside of parenting as a place of happiness, even though it's so difficult, um, because the kind of joy that your child can bring you is so knocks everything else over things that used to to really get me going about like you know getting an assignment I really wanted or they still exist and they're part of like that work me but right now my four and a half year old is learning how to read and watching her read on her own watching how proud of herself she is and watching the independence that it gives her and the way she's sort of like opening herself up to all these little experiences is is really very joyful for me, especially knowing that even though having your children grow away from you is difficult, that she will now be able to enter places without me. She'll be able to go into worlds without me or my husband bringing her into them. And she gets to have her own private imaginative experiences in them and I love thinking about that for her because I I think about my own reading childhood and learning about Prince Edward Island in Anne of Green Gables and going under cupboards or with characters or into magical places and I just oh I just love imagining that for her that's such a beautiful answer. I love that. It's almost seeing someone share well the potential of sharing in the type of joy and also soothing that you get from books I'm assuming we into these worlds and it can help just be pure fun and escapist and transforming to see a little person have those worlds open must be lovely okay Hilary so you're going to be writing about lots of books you weren't able to talk about this year how can we follow you and your work so Twitter is the best place to see what I've been working on. I try to keep myself to just one social media outlet because it is a noxious weed that will wrap itself around your legs and yank you underground if you don't look out. So (laughs) that's mostly where I can be found with the caveat that I will be on maternity leave for a little bit because I'm having another baby. Hilary, thank you so much. I love hearing your perspective on things and Let's keep the conversations going. Thank you so much for listening to this episode with Hilary Kelly. You can find her on Twitter at Hilary Kelly. We'll be back in two weeks. We'll see you then.